Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank the members for their comments and questions for the Ministry of Finance. Uh, members' questions covered four areas. First, our fiscal position and our financing our, and surplus sharing approach. Second, the government's efforts in ensuring value for money in our spending and procurement. Third, our plans to create opportunities for businesses and to enhance citizens' experience with technology. And fourth, the role of shareholders and some tax-related matters. So I will address the cuts on the first two topics, and Senior Minister of State, Ms. Indrani, will take the other two cuts. On our fiscal position, uh, Mr. Cedric Fu asked about the proportion of capital investment compared to recurrent spending or operating expenditure. And so let me start by elaborating on our overall funding approach. In fact, this is what the Finance Minister had, had explained in his budget speech, that we fund recurrent needs through taxation and we will consider borrowing for major infrastructure projects. But even as we look at borrowing, we will only do so prudently and on a selective basis. We should borrow for the right projects, those that are bankable, that generate adequate future revenue streams to repay the borrowing. Uh, one example that we are looking at is Changi Airport Terminal 5. Uh, if we don't do this, if we are not careful and selective in borrowing, we may end up overburdening ourselves with rising interest costs, and that's not what we intend to do. So therefore, even as we borrow, there will still be capital projects that we continue to fund through development expenditure from the annual budget. And so for 2018, FY 2018, the share of development expenditure in the total budget is around 28%. It's slightly higher than what it used to be, but it's in the ballpark. Looking ahead, we expect development expenditures to rise as we continue to invest in more capital projects. But at the same time, operating expenditures are also going to increase, especially in areas as was highlighted in the budget, like healthcare, security and other social spending. So overall, both will go up, but we, believe, we expect that the share of development spending to continue to rise slightly in the coming years. Uh, so, so we will continue to monitor this share between operating and development spending. It's an important balance. Because if we spend too much on recurrent, then we are not investing enough for the future, we are not building capabilities for the future. If we spend too much on capital, then we may end up with a very long tail of future spending for maintenance and replacement. So it's critical to get the balance right, and that's what we are doing. Uh, many of the capital projects in the government are undertaken by our statutory boards. Mr. Pritam Singh asked about the harmonization of accounts, because our stat boards use accrual basis for their accounts and ministries use cash. Uh, this is approach we have taken, because we believe that cash accounting allows for better control of spending and it's a more prudent way of fiscal management. And that's not just us. Many governments also do cash accounting for their ministries. But for stat boards, uh, they use accrual for their accounts because stat, stat boards are set up as separate legal entities with their own financial statements and their own financial accounts. Some stat boards even go to the markets to borrow. So we want our statutory boards to be subject to the same discipline as the private sector. And that's why they use accrual accounts like what private sector companies do. The important thing is this. Uh, regardless of whether the work is carried out by a ministry or a statutory board, we take a whole of government approach on how we finance our infrastructure. And the water network is a case in point. Uh, briefly put, PUB collects revenue and pays for the investment and operations and maintenance of the water supply system. That includes our reservoirs, treatment plants and pipelines, and also the water reclamation plants for the treatment of used water. If there are any surpluses in its accounts, PUB will plow them back into investments in infrastructural works, such as the upgrading of the waterworks, water reclamation plant expansions, and investment in water treatment processes, as well as in R&D. And from FY 2012 to FY 2016, PUB has transferred 1.3 billion of surpluses into its capital reserves. However, this is still not sufficient to fully cover the 4 billion that PUB will be investing in additional water infrastructure between FY 2017 and FY 2021. And because there's this gap in its financing cash flows, POC, PUB also borrows for its capital investments. So this is what happens within the PUB accounts. 
But on top of this, the government funds the drainage system that helps to manage flooding risk, the sewage network system that helps to safeguard public health, and projects to help strengthen the resilience of our water supply. These assets are part of our total water loop, but they also provide benefits to all citizens. So the government pays for these assets and we do not recover the cost directly from consumers. Indeed, from FY 2012 to FY 2016, government investments in drainage and sewage totaled $2.1 billion, far in excess of the water conservation tax revenue. And in the next decade, we are also building phase two of the deep, deep tunnel sewage system, which costs more than $4 billion. These are costly but important investments that we need to make. So expenditure in our water system is recorded in both PUB's accounts and in the government's budget because of how we structure the payments between the consumer and the taxpayer. While they use different bases for accounting, as I've explained, each is appropriate for its use. What remains is important is sound fiscal and financial management to ensure timely and adequate investments in our public infrastructure and assets. We do this for water, we do this for all other public infrastructure as well. Several members, Mr. Liang Enghua, Ms. Fu Miha, Dr. Tan Wu Meng, Mr. Henry Quang, and Ms. Sun Shui Ling spoke about the need to be prudent, efficient, and effective in our spending. I fully agree with them, and this is indeed an area of continuing emphasis for MOF. I was a budget officer in MOF way back in 2000. Uh, so I've seen how firsthand how budgeting, our budgeting system has evolved over the years. Uh, MOF officers scrutinized every project, even back then. We've had robust processes in place for budgeting. We check against cost norms. We make the necessary cuts in the budget of ministries and agencies. It's not work that endears yourself to colleagues in other ministries, I assure you. Uh, they see MOF as blocking their projects or delaying their projects. But we take these in our stride and we do the work. Now, almost 20 years later, I can say that our processes for budgeting and ensuring value for money have developed further and become even more rigorous. Uh, we have put in place various systems and controls to ensure that monies are spent effectively. First, the block budget framework sets a limit, spending limit for ministries, and within the budget given to them, each agency optimizes its spending and channels resources to worthwhile programs. The 2% reduction to the budget cap announced at the last budget and the reduction to the annual growth of the block budgets announced recently by the finance minister will further encourage fiscal discipline among government agencies. We have the budget utilization framework which encourages ministries to budget as closely as possible to their expenditure needs. Uh, this is to ensure they do not set aside more than they require and as a result deprive other meritorious needs of funding. But I would assure Ms. Fu Miha that ministries do not spend for the sake of spending or of meeting the budget, especially during the end of the year. And if there is any underutilization of the budget due to reasons which are beyond the ministry's control, there will not be any penalties to their future budgets. We also have mechanisms to give ministries budgeting flexibility so they can roll over part of the savings from the operating budget to the next financial year. On top of all this, we conduct regular reviews of ministries' block budgets to make sure that they continue to be right-sized and ensure that every ministry uses its allocated resources effectively and efficiently. Second, for large infrastructure projects, we have the gateway process. This is something that we have shared in this house. It's a rigorous, multi-stage process that scrutinizes the requirements, the scope, and the design of projects at key milestones before funding approval is given. And this process includes reviews not just by senior public officers, but by academics and industry practitioners where necessary, especially practitioners with deep technical expertise. Third, MOF works with agencies to conduct value for money reviews to assess if our programs are achieving their intended outcomes in a cost-effective manner. These best practices, guidelines, and case studies from the reviews are shared across the public service. Fourth, the performance of key performance, key programs are published by the ministries for their respective areas. Uh, these performance indicators are also consolidated and reported in the annual revenue and expenditure estimates and in the Singapore Public Sector Outcomes Review, which is published 
once every two years. Uh, Ms. Fumia asked if agencies conduct productivity reviews to ensure their operating efficiency. Indeed, that is done. Ministries have processes in place to more effectively reallocate resources within themselves, within their budgets, and to extract productivity dividends from their departments and statutory boards. Uh, we also have a manpower management framework to keep public sector manpower growth at a sustainable rate in line with the resident labour force growth. And this framework allows for manpower to be redeployed to implement new programmes or deliver enhanced services while preventing the over-expansion of public sector manpower over time. Mr Liang in Hua and some were concerned that the economy drive will impact on public services. And I would like to assure them that uh, ministries will be more resource effective without compromising service delivery. Even with the announced measures to constrain expenditure growth, overall ministry budgets in dollar terms are still expected to grow, albeit at a slower rate. Agencies are given time to adjust to the budget changes and will have the resources to fulfil their missions and maintain service levels. Of course, achieving value for money goes beyond cutting costs. It is also about creating greater value while we carefully manage the cost. And government agencies have sought to achieve value for money while improving service delivery and outcomes in various ways. For infrastructure in particular, something that Ms. Fu Miha, Dr. Tan Wu Ming and several others spoke about, we have stepped up efforts to manage our infrastructure spending. And let me elaborate on some of these measures. First, we adopt a systems approach when we plan and design projects. So we do not look at each project in isolation, but we consider how they affect one another and the potential synergies of multiple projects collectively. We look for opportunities for infrastructure integration, which allows us to achieve better outcomes or reap savings. The finance and transport ministers have shared one example, which is the LTA's innovative four-in-one depot that saved the government $4 billion. Another example is the integration of PUB's Tuas Water Reclamation Plan with the NEA's Integrated Waste Management Facility, which brings about a number of synergies while optimizing land use. For example, within this integrated facility, the co-digestion of food waste from NEA's facility with the used water sludge from PUB's facility generates more biogas and enhances energy production. This allows both facilities to be self-sufficient in energy. And the two plants will also enjoy other synergies like the sharing of common administrative facilities. So adopting a systems approach is useful. It creates more value, maximizes synergies, and that's what we are doing. It also allows us to take a life cycle perspective when planning and designing our infrastructure, which I think several members spoke about as well. I think Dr. Tan Wu Ming and Ms. Sun Shui highlighted the need uh, to ensure value for money over the life cycle of our infrastructure. This is indeed an area which we are placing greater emphasis on. Dr. Tan talked about design. Uh, we typically associate architects and designers with aesthetics, and they do produce very beautiful buildings, but I think the architectural profession too is very conscious that they cannot just design for aesthetics. Structure alone is not enough. They also have to design for functionality and maintainability, and that shift is happening. Uh, BCA issues guides to help architects and designers better understand how, can, how they can design buildings to achieve safer, more labour-efficient and more cost-effective maintenance downstream. So BCA is also helping the industry and the architectural profession to make this shift towards better designs for functionality and maintainability. Public sector agencies like HDB and JTC have incorporated these guidelines into their checklist when they do procurement, when they do projects. And so you will see a lot more consciousness in life cycle, in good design, when these projects are being done. Now, with a life cycle approach, we don't just look at the upfront price of a project, but we look at the overall life cycle cost. So one example is how when we do a pro building project to achieve the green mark platinum standard, we in fact incur a cost premium of 3 to 5%. But the additional upfront costs are more than offset by downstream savings from reduced energy and water consumption. So it makes sense from a life cycle perspective. 
Apart from such efforts, we are building up core engineering capabilities within the government, as highlighted by Ms. Sun Shueling, to achieve value for money for public projects from a life cycle perspective. Uh, the Centre of Excellence for Building and Infrastructure was set up in 2016 under JTC. This is a shared service centre to help build and sustain in-house engineering capabilities across the public service, from planning, design, project management to facilities management. One example is JTC's efforts to roll out smart facilities management solutions for its industrial properties. By monitoring and analyzing real-time data from its buildings centrally, JTC is able to better optimize building performance and respond to faults quickly. And after piloting this approach on three of its properties, JTC estimates that it can achieve a 15% improvement in productivity and energy savings. So it's sharing its experiences and lessons learned with the rest of the public sector. To maximize value from limited resources, government agencies also look for new and innovative ways to do more with less. We continue to challenge the status quo and make use of technology to enhance work effectiveness while achieving manpower savings. One example is the Parking.SG app. I'm, I'm sure mem many members would have uh, heard about this or are already using it today. Uh, in fact, we've been trying to do away with parking coupons for some time. The original thinking was that this could be achieved through ERP2, but this would have taken some time and it would have been a very complex system. But last year, GovTech, HDB and URA, the team of officers came together to develop this Parking.SG app. And so now we have a quick and convenient way to pay for short-term parking. Drivers are only charged on a per-minute basis and they can extend their parking sessions remotely instead of having to return to their vehicles to add more coupons. And since the app was launched in October last year, about 250,000 vehicles have used it on more than 2 million parking sessions. Uh, delivering value for every dollar spent is the responsibility of each and every public service officer, but it should not be limited to government agencies alone. Through greater partnership with businesses and the community, we have worked hand in hand to deliver better outcomes for Singapore and Singaporeans. One example is IRAS's hackathon to crowdsource solutions to make it easier for companies and individuals to file their taxes. Now, filing taxes is never a pleasant experience, but we can make the process streamlined and convenient for everyone. So through this hackathon, uh, this uh, group of individuals uh, called themselves Thinker Tax was one of the winners in the hackathon Thinker Tax. It's an online application that helps SMEs prepare for the submission of their corporate income tax return. And with Thinker Tax, companies can convert accounting income to taxable income for their income tax returns in three easy steps. It's an innovative solution which helps small companies complete their tax return filing more easily. Our libraries are also a good example of partnering the community to encourage everyone to contribute towards a shared journey of lifelong learning. Volunteer-run spaces in libraries have increased by over 300% in the past three years. For example, an entire floor of the Tampanese Regional Library is run by volunteers, there's also a dedicated library space for volunteers to gather and plan activities to promote reading to other library users. Together with the re-engineering of its library, services, library spaces and services to introduce more automation and self-service, NLB has been able to increase its staff productivity. The library space managed per library staff has more than doubled from 88 square meters per staff to 183 square meters today. Next, let me talk about procurement. Ms. Sun Shueling and Mr. Henry Quack raised important points about ensuring value for money in our procurement, and I'll explain our approach to achieving this. First, the public service operates on a common procurement policy framework. Every agency procures through a central procurement portal, GBIS, and sub most suppliers submit invoices electronically through a platform called Vendors at Gov. This allows government agencies and suppliers to reap efficiency gains. Second, we consider both price and quality factors when we do procurement. There is a perception out there that government purchases only on price alone, 
but that is not the case. About half of all government procurement today are not awarded to the lowest priced bidder because they are put out on a PQM, price and quality uh, methodology. Uh, quality factors would include reliability, innovativeness, expertise of the vendor, its track record and much more. For construction-related tenders, which make up more than half of our annual procurement value, BCA has enhanced the frameworks to achieve, to place even greater emphasis on quality from this year onwards. So, for example, consultancy tenderers are now required to provide a breakdown of the manpower deployment and rates so that agencies can better assess whether the proposed resources are commensurate with the quoted fees. For building projects, the weightage of quality has increased from 40% to a maximum of 50%. And BCA has also introduced consultants and contractors past for performance as a mandatory criteria for tender evaluation. So this provides a quality feedback loop to recognize firms that have performed well in previous projects. Thirdly, the public sector serves, seeks to centralize our procurement wherever appropriate. One way is by aggregating demand for common purchases across agencies. One agency calls a bulk tender on behalf of others. This minimizes administration costs and ensures, enables quality, this quantity discounts. Today, there are over 70 types of bulk contracts, accounting for about one third of government spend in goods and services. The commonly purchased categories include office equipment, graphic design, travel related services, and infocom related products and services, all on bulk tender. There is, however, a limit to how much centralization or standardization is optimal. Overdoing this can create other problems. For example, we risk vendor capture if many agencies buy from a single supplier and we are locked into the same supplier for subsequent maintenance and replacements. We also need to be mindful of providing sufficient opportunities for SMEs. And indeed, many members often ask about giving more opportunities for small firms to bid for government projects. So if we have too large a contract, that is more likely to be taken up by the big suppliers only. Too much centralization or standardizing also limits flexibilities or variations to meet the unique needs of agencies or situations. So we need to strike a judicious balance. Uh, finally, we continue to strengthen procurement capabilities to enable our officers to obtain value for money and innovative solutions for the market. From the market, uh, we are stepping up procurement training for our officers. Members are aware of this. We have partnered the Singapore University of Social Sciences and this staff for this purpose. Uh, lead agencies with deep procurement capabilities are providing advice and solutions to the rest of the public sector. And we are also building up capabilities to enable negotiations to be carried out in a fair way that achieves value for money and win-win outcomes for both buyers and suppliers. Uh, Mr. Yi Chia Singh asked about the support for the local construction sector. Actually, uh, this cut may be better filed under MND. So I'm not sure if I'm taking this as <laughs> MOF or MND. We can discuss further in the MOD, MND COS coming up later. Um, but I would like to say, you know, Mr. E asked if we can require foreign companies to form a joint venture with local firms to bid for contracts. Uh, this is not permitted under WTO rules. Uh, as uh, he talked about price diving by foreign firms, we are aware that this happens, but it's not limited to foreign firms. The fact is that the construction industry is in a downturn. Many companies are bidding for projects, and they, there is price diving that happens. We are aware of this. But as I've highlighted earlier, price is not the only factor used in evaluating government tenders. We are placing greater emphasis on the quality factors. And we have also introduced measures to deter price diving because we want to avoid a situation where a company, local or foreign, tries too hard to secure a contract, dives the price, and then ends up not being able to deliver, or worse, compromise on quality just to get the project done within the price. So for construction tenders, various agencies have adopted practices to identify abnormally low bids and scrutinize the contractor's ability to de deliver the projects at such prices. Uh, we also continue to ensure our construction projects contracts remain accessible to local companies that may be smaller in size. About four-fifths of, of all our construction contracts are below $650,000 in value, which smaller local firms without a track record can participate in. 
Where suitable, we have broken up some of our bigger projects into smaller contracts to give local companies a better opportunity to participate. And encouragingly, some local companies are also partnering foreign companies to undertake bigger projects, not by mandating it, but they are voluntarily doing so, like Wohab, which has been partnering Shanghai T Tunnel Engineering to construct the MRT lines and stations. So these are positive examples, and there will be technology transfer in future. Our local firms can bid for the projects on their own. So our approach is not to restrict competition, but help our companies level up their capabilities so that they are competitive on their own merits. And we have a whole series of programs and schemes in place to do this, including the industry transformation map for the built environment sector, which we will discuss more in MND's COS. Finally, let me address Mr. Asmun Ahmad's suggestion to share more of FY 2017's budget surplus with Singaporeans. I should say we should not look at the SG bonus in isolation. In fact, the entire surplus of seven point of uh, entire surplus is given back to Singaporeans in different ways, not just through the SG bonus. The five billion we set aside for the rail infrastructure fund to build future MRT lines. This will benefit all MRT con commuters. Another two billion is for subsidies on Elder Shield premiums and other related support when the Elder Shield review is complete, and that will be happening soon. So these premium subsidies from lower and middle income Singaporeans will ensure that the enhanced Elder Shield scheme remains affordable, and the premium subsidies will directly benefit individuals and families. So you have to look at the surplus in totality. We don't save surpluses. We give them all back to Singaporeans, but we give back in different forms. Some will be for spending for future needs, some will be spending for current needs, like the Elder Shield premiums, and some will be through a direct transfer, like the SG bonus. And when you look at the direct transfers, we should also recognize that besides the SG bonus itself, there are other social transfers in the budget, like the GSD voucher, the USAFE rebates, and the SNCC rebates. And in fact, the support we provide to Singaporeans who need help goes beyond the SG bonus and these direct transfer schemes. Because in various areas like housing, healthcare, education, and childcare, we have enhanced the support provided by our permanent schemes over the years with more assistance targeted at the lower income. Mr. Chairman, against the backdrop of rising needs, the government will continue to fund our expenditure wisely and manage our spending prudently. We will ensure that our policies and processes for budgeting, procurement, and evaluation help us to optimize resources and achieve value for money. We will partner the private sector and the community to create a better future for Singapore. Thank you.